How do you define yourself? Are you British? Are you an Ulster man? Are you Irish? Or are you a combination of all of these? Well, well I describe myself as a child of God, first of all. I think that uh, many of these things overlap in a man's life. I, I know quite a number of Roman Catholic people who are very strongly unionist. I know uh, other Protestant people <laughs> who perhaps would say we, we should leave Britain and have a united Ireland. Uh, I, I think that there have been changes because of the, uh, the make up of people. Could you stop there? Yes. I'm not asking about other people. I'm asking about you, Ian Paisley. How would you define yourself? I don't need to define myself. I'm already known. Yeah, but, okay. And the people who have put a label on me, it could be a false label or a... Or but would, a you, would you ever consider yourself in any sense Irish? Oh, I, I'm not ashamed to be called an Irishman. I'm not. And uh, I was down recently in Dublin and was entertained by the president and taken in and treated like a... A buddy. There was a time, sir, it would not have been described as taking the soup. Well, it could be, but if the soup was good, why not I take it? As a man, I mean, yeah, man, if you get it for nothing, that's bonus. Ian Paisley was born in 1926 in uncertain times, just five years after Ireland was partitioned and governments established in Belfast and Dublin. His father, James, a Baptist minister in Armagh City, had been a member of Edward Carson's Ulster Volunteer Force, opposed to independence for Ireland. The political environment in the early 1920s was still volatile, as Ian Pearcey's father was to find out. He was a very jolly, a very happy man. And he had a little Austin 6 car, which was quite a, a, a car. And he went uh, around the country uh, visiting and preaching. And after my birth, he was out visiting uh, one night. And he ran into 50 men, all armed on the roadside. And they pulled him out of his thing and put him against the wall. And we're going to shoot him. They were uh, gunmen who wanted a United Ireland and thought that uh, my father was a danger to that. Would they have known him? Oh, I always oh, was well known. My father was very well known. And there was and then a man came in and he said, he said, don't how dare you touch this man? His his wife has just had uh, their second child, and it would be very unlucky uh, to us if we did this. So they, they had a conference and they decided to let, to let him go if he never would mention what he had seen. So the reason he got away was me, because I had been born. So you were the little miracle that arrived that, and saved that, his life. That's right, that's right. Amazing. At the age of two, Ian Paisley's family moved from Armagh to Ballymena, where his father was appointed minister to Hill Street Baptist Church. It was his Scottish-born mother, Isabella, however, who was responsible for his evangelical conversion. I was converted at a meeting that my mother was conducting among children. She was speaking on the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And I was touched greatly at that time, although I was only six years of age. And at the end of the meeting, I said to my mother, I wouldn't like to be a lost sheep. I'd rather be a saved lamb. And she said, let's go down into the church. So I went down into the church, and it was at that seat that my mother got me to kneel and appointed me to Christ. What about holidays? Did you go on holidays? Oh, yes, we always went on holidays. Where did you go? Uh, well, uh, the place we went, uh, was Cologne uh, outside Warm Point. Did you ever uh, journey southwards? Did you ever go down to Carlingford or places oh, like yes, that? Oh, yes, I went to Carlingford. Did you naturally uh, come in t contact with the uh, local Catholics there if you I were did. down on holidays yeah. and that? I did, oh, yeah. And did you mingle easily? Oh, yes. Uh, 
we prayed together, we did, and, and they, they, they went to, with me uh, and the boys on the 12th of July to Warm Point, and then we all went, <laughs> we all went on August day with them to their place. So did you march with the Hibernians for the crack? No, I don't remember, never got, they never let me in. <laughs> they didn't let me in. After leaving school, the 16-year-old Ian Paisley went to work on the farm of a family friend, George Watson, in County Tyrone. I learned to plough, I learned to sow, I learned the uh, uh, running of a farm. The Bible entered my mind very much when I was there. And I remember one day out in the field, I stopped the ploughing and I got down on my knees and I told the Lord that I was willing to go where he wanted me to go, to say what he wanted me to say, and uh, to be a preacher of the gospel. And uh, I then said to the man I was living with, I said, next Sunday I want to say a word at the church uh, or the mission hall, uh, which I did, and I thought I could uh, give a long sermon. It lasted for three minutes. It was a disaster. It was a humbling, a very humbling uh, thing for me. Ian Paisley then moved to a school of evangelism in Wales to study theology. He quickly started to make a name for himself as a preacher before returning to Belfast to complete his studies. His first ministry was at Ravenhill Evangelical Mission Church in East Belfast. There he started organizing revival missions and was soon attracting large crowds wherever he went. How did you end up being invited to preach in Crossgar? Well, the cr committee of the Crossgar Mission Hall went to Balamina. Uh, during the great meet meeting missions I had there. And they were absolutely thrilled. And uh, they then met me and said, could you not come and do the same in Cross Car? Though this invitation came from a small mission hall, it was to have far-reaching consequences for the local Presbyterian church. The mission hall was too small, so they decided to ask the church for the use of the church hall. But then the Kirk session of the church, which is the ruling body, decided they were going to have this mission. And then suddenly the presbytery stepped in above their heads and closed the door of the church. And uh, I mean, it was, it was something that should not have been done. This in turn led to a split from which emerged Ian Paisley's Free Presbyterian Church. Congregations sprang up across Northern Ireland throughout the 1950s. These new churches were started by people attracted to Ian Paisley's fundamentalist message. At a great cost, over 400 years ago, the martyrs and reformers and confessors broke the shackles of popey superstition and priestcraft and recovered the gospel in what is known in history as the Great Reformation. I am a Reformation Protestant. Nobody escaped your wrath. Nobody. In 1959, you spoke of the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret in the following words when they had an audience with the Pope. Yes. You accused them of committing spiritual fornication and adultery with the Antichrist. Wasn't that extraordinary no, no, in, that, in tone? That, that, that was the language of Luther. That was the language of Calvin. That was the language of Protestantism. Uh, and I have no apology to make for, my, uh, for being a Protestant. Ian Paisley's attacks on the Catholic Church were becoming ever more confrontational. The mouthpiece for these accusations, Northern Ireland's militant Protestant leader, the Reverend Ian Paisley. Denounced in turn as Adolf Paisley by Catholic opponents, he was the focal point of the demonstration. 
In 1962, he even took his protests against Catholicism to the Vatican. I mean, they were trying to sell the thing that the Reformation was a mistake, that there, there's no Reformation Protestants now. There's no men that believe the Bible, the Bible only the religion of Protestants. And uh, they were very active and and uh, and uh, the time had come for a stand to be taken. Come 1963, uh, Pope John the Twenty Third dies. Yes. You're reported as having said, "The Romish man of sin is now in hell." How could you stand over that for a Well, I don't know whether I said that or not. I, I, Do you I, think I, I'm making that up? No, no. I, I think that people make up things. I'd put them into my mouth and Would that be them, your sentiment, though? Would what? that be the way you would think at that point in time right. about the death of the Pope? The Romish man of sin is in hell. Is that how you would have thought of that? No, I, I, I think that anybody who is not saved by the grace of God will be lost in hell forever. The spirit of Edward Carson, the father figure of unionism, ran in the veins of Ian Paisley in his opposition to Dublin's involvement in the affairs of Northern Ireland. As the Ulster, where the loyalists shall walk, they go walk for thy kindred. More and more, he was identifying with individuals in the tradition of Carson. Foremost among these was a former policeman turned firebrand politician, District Inspector John William Nixon. Why was D.I. Nixon, a former police officer, a, a dissident uh, a unionist in many ways, yes. MP, why was Nixon so important in your life? Well, uh, he was important in my life because he was uh, uh, the impersonation of uh, the battle and what uh, it really was about in Northern Ireland. And, of course, that was the, 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 the uh, a stand taken against those that would uh, uh, take away our flag, uh, take away our position in the Union. But how prudent was it for you, as an emerging uh, young politician, clergyman, to be identified with a man against whom the allegations have been made, that he had been involved in murder? Was it wise for somebody like you to be identified with Well, I liked a man that was prepared to stand up for what he believed in, and uh, I... Uh, uh, everything I said was said about you in those days if you uh, interfered with the official unionist uh, uh, people. They felt that they would just snub you out. <laughs> but some people were not going to be snubbed out. From now on, Ian Paisley was regularly involved in one street protest or another against any expression of Irish nationalism. The tricolour was regularly flown in places like West Belfast. Ian Paisley protested against the presence of a green, white and gold flag in the window of the Diva Street headquarters of the Republican Party and demanded that it be taken down. Rioting broke out and lasted for two nights when the government capitulated and ordered the police to remove the flag. You knew the geography of this city better than anybody else. Yes. Uh, you walked the streets, you knew the people. Was it prudent of you to go into Divis Street in 1964 to, uh, to remove a flag from the Republican office there Surely that was a pretty provocative thing to do. Well, I didn't remove anything. But you, you led the protest which urged that the flag be removed. And you, you can't exonerate yourself. Well, you? but, well, uh, 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 it was my attitude, and I, I believe I was right in what I did. Despite the fact that you triggered a riot uh, two nights in a row and that uh, people got injured, was that a prudent uh, well, behaviour? <laughs> the riot was rioting. The people who rioted are the people that have to pay for that, not me. Ian Paisley's line of attack was now twofold. The defence of Protestantism and bolting the door on Dublin. 
an invitation to Stormont in 1967 by Northern Ireland's Prime Minister Terence O'Neill to his Irish counterpart Taoiseach Jack Lynch provided another opportunity for Ian Paisley to protest. Was it not the convention of, of the time that uh, neighbor, neighbor, neighborly prime ministers no. uh, would no. be invited from country to country? No. Was that well, not the, was that No, not there the was law? a time, you know perfectly well, there was a time that no uh, uh, unionists would have been uh, invited to, the, to Dublin. Uh, and no, uh, no shinners or others would be invited uh, from Dublin to here. In opposing what Ian Paisley saw as the Protestant Church's embrace of ecumenism, the mainstream Presbyterians' annual General Assembly at Church House became a regular target. In 1966, Ian Paisley led a march to the Assembly through the predominantly nationalist area of Cromock Street with almost predictable consequences. Why, Mr Paisley, did you feel compelled to protest against the, the meeting of the General Assembly in 1966? Because I, I always had a protest. Well, I, I always had a protest. Why? Because that was part of our uh, exposure of what was happening in the Assembly. What was worrying you about their behaviour at that point in time, though? Well, there was, a, there was a, certainly a very strong uh, ecumenical movement uh, abroad in the church in those days. But did you not know that there was always the potential, the danger for trouble when you no, engaged no, in these no. street protests? Uh, if you're trying to justify today what uh, uh, was done at Cromick Street, you need to go and talk to the people who were responsible for that, not to me. Also in 1966, Ian Paisley launched his own newspaper, the Protestant Telegraph, to spread his political and religious message. His firebrand oratory in attacking the Catholic Church was uncompromising. And we are going to keep the thoroughfares open for our Protestant faith and our Protestant heritage. Mr Paisley, you reported after a rally as saying the following. Catholic homes caught fire because they were loaded with petrol bombs. Catholic churches were attacked and burned because there were arsenals and priests handed out submachine guns to parishioners. Mm -hmm. Did you say that? Did you I believe don't know. that? I have no more memory of saying that, but it was true that there were guns in the churches. And it was true that there was a man in the, in the, Roma, in the Roman Catholic churches who used the churches uh, as a safe place to hide. But were you directly implicating priests in concealing guns in churches and giving cover to IRA I men in churches? I said, I said what I said. I have nothing to add to it. You also said that the massive discrimination in employment and allocation of public housing for Catholics existed because they breed like rabbits and multiply like vermin. Mm. Would you stand over that well, today? I have no, I have no uh, record of that on that, what I said. Do you think you have might I? have said it? No, I don't think I would have said it. I don't you were reported as having I said it. I will. I mean, they would have reported it, I think. Addressing a crowd at Loch Gaul in County Armagh, yes. you are reported as having said the following, I am anti-Roman Catholic, but God being my judge, I love the poor dupes who are ground down under that system. Yes, so I do. And I love them and I want to bring them to a place of freedom. Uh, in the gospel the same way as I love the Protestants. And you're not walking away from that statement? Well, I, 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 if I said it, I would. Uh, I have no apology to make for saying it. But I don't know where you get these quotes from. Some of them are... You're well reported, sir. They're well reported uh, and over-reported. The Provisional IRA is the military wing of the Roman Catholic Church, you said at one stage. Did yeah. you genuinely believe well, that? Well, that's, that's true. That's, Stands true in history. But they, they, they have been the, 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 the people that the Church of Rome used to forward their interests. Yes. I want to give you another little colourful yes, quote. Yes. The dog will return to its vomit. The washed sow will return to its wallowing in the mire. Mm -hmm. But by God's grace, we will never return to popery again. 
New Pope here, 1982. That's right. Yes. That's Wasn't right. that very colourful? Yes, very colourful, very, very right. Do you, do you, you don't expect me to go to Rome, do you? <laughs> Are you trying to convert me? <laughs> in the mid-1960s, a student-led protest began in Northern Ireland with Queen's University as its hub. This campaign was influenced by the civil rights movement in America, which was demanding equal rights for black people. Here, the demands were for equal voting rights for Catholics, equal job opportunities, and the fair allocation of housing. This civil rights movement was Ian Paisley's next target. A counter-demonstration organized by Ian Paisley against the civil rights march in Armagh City in November 1968 resulted in serious rioting. Everything has been done by the police to hinder the rightful assembly of Protestants in this town today. And yet the roads have been left open for the civil rights movement. Less than two weeks later, amidst the worsening situation, the modernizing Prime Minister Terence O'Neill went on television and pledged change and reform, but did not concede one man, one vote, a fundamental demand of the civil rights movement. Ulster stands at the crossroads. I believe you know me well enough by now to appreciate that I am not a man given to extravagant language. The bully boy tactics we saw in our ma are no answer to these grave problems, but they incur for us the contempt of Britain and the world. To this day, unionist politicians rarely admit to discrimination against Catholics or that the regime of the time rigged and gerrymandered electoral boundaries to its advantage. Places like Derry and Fermanagh, where there were nationalist majorities, the council was still controlled by unionists numerically. Was that fair? No, it wasn't fair. Fair government is that every man has the same power to vote for what he wants. In Dungannon in 1963, mm -hmm. there were over 300 families on the waiting list for a house and no Catholic had been allocated a permanent house for 34 years. How was unacceptable it, was that? How unacceptable at all. So it wasn't. Was that British justice? No, it wasn't, it wasn't justice at all. Uh, and, and those that put their hands to that uh, were, uh, have to carry some of the uh, of the blunt and blame for what has happened in our country. What do you mean uh, by that? Well, I, I simply what I mean. I mean that if you vote uh, down democracy, uh, you're responsible for, for bringing in anarchy. And they brought in the anarchy, and they set family against family and, and friend against friend. In Derry's Guildhall in 1967, unionists held 60% of the seats, yet unionism had only 32% of the vote. Yes. Did you think that was fair? No, there, there should be, but that's the way it was. The whole system was wrong. It wasn't one man, one vote. I mean, uh, that's no way to run any country. There should be absolute freedom and there should be absolute liberty. What might be baffling and puzzling, Mr. Paisley, uh, to many people listening to what you have just said is why you were so determined to oppose the demand for one man, one vote, as advocated by people like John Hume and Austin Curry at that point in time. Because the civil rights movement was a, a movement that actually was a United Ireland movement. How can you say that? Well, that, that's what they were doing. They were associating themselves with the battle uh, that the ordinary, decent, law-abiding Protestant could not associate themselves. How can you say that? Weren't John Hume and Austin Curry and people like them simply asking for British civil rights, the rights yes. to vote? What was wrong with that? Well, Those were well, British I, rights. How can you say that they were associating well, with, with the United Ireland or the United Islanders if they were simply asking for British civil rights, the right to vote? Because the civil rights movement was tied up with threats 
and was tied up with other things. It wasn't only, it wasn't only in that. Did you see it as a front for a united Ireland? Then? Yes, it was part of the part of the overall cauldron that was burning, and was being heated by various uh, sort of sections of the community to get their own way. The frequency of civil rights marches in various towns and cities throughout Northern Ireland in pursuit of reform culminated in the Battle of the Bogside in Derry City in August 1969. Faced with a beleaguered Royal Ulster Constabulary, the British government sent troops onto the streets for only the second time since the inception of the state. Terence O'Neill is a dictator on a Monday. No surrender! Ian Paisley was relentless in his verbal attacks on Terence O'Neill, portraying him as feeble. His support was growing in a restless unionist community. His popularity was further enhanced in the wake of two spells in jail arising from his street agitation. In 1969, Terence O'Neill resigned as Prime Minister. The following year, Ian Paisley replaced him as the Stormont MP for Banside, and months later, he won the Westminster seat for North Antrim. Ian Richard Kyle Paisley, 7,981. In 1971, Ian Paisley formed his own political party, the Democratic Unionist Party, along with Desmond Bowl, a barrister and unionist MP, who had been one of Terence O'Neill's harshest critics. This was the start of a very long friendship. These were turbulent days in Northern Ireland. Bloody Sunday was a watershed. What was your reaction when you heard about 13 people having been shot dead on the streets of Derry on the 30th of January 1972? Oh, I was very angry that that's what it had come to. I felt uh, it was a very uh, dangerous thing, and then uh, an attempt to cover it uh, for what it was not. I mean, uh, the the uh, inquiry afterwards uh, proved that some of these people they had neither weapons nor were they using weapons. They were just making a protest within the law. Uh, were you a bit embarrassed, though, when David Cameron ultimately, 35 years later, apologised and, and said in, in Parliament that the killings were unjustified and wrong? Well, I wasn't uh, embarrassed. I was glad to hear him for the first time as a British uh, leader telling the truth about it, saying what really did happen. Worried by the escalating violence and exasperated by the pace of political reform, London suspended the Northern Ireland government and took control of security, introducing direct rule for the first time. A conference of the British and Irish governments and local parties, but not the DUP, met at Sunningdale in England to work out how political power could be restored. Agreement was reached to set up a power-sharing executive giving nationalists cabinet positions for the first time. This accord also aimed at giving the Irish government an ongoing input into the affairs of Northern Ireland. The creation of this new administration in 1974, headed by Ulster Unionist Party leader Brian Faulkner, triggered another crisis. What was so wrong with the, of the, with the idea of the SDLP and the Alliance Party and members and representatives of the Catholic nationalist community being in government, uh, being part of an administration ruling Northern Ireland? What well, the people of Northern Ireland made that choice. That would be fine with me, but they didn't make that choice. This was something being forced on us. What do you say to your critics, though, and the critics uh, of that time, mm -hmm. who would argue that the, the opposition to a Council of Ireland, to any involvement of Dublin and the affairs of Northern Ireland at that stage, was a smokescreen to stop Catholics having any power in the, in the government of Northern Ireland. Well, I don't accept that at all, uh, in, in the sense that uh, you are saying, they're saying that 
They wanted to destroy Northern Ireland and uh, the uh, uh, people in Westminster uh, were in it up over the heads. They wanted rid of us too, so they did. Ian Paisley's tone was growing increasingly belligerent. A loose coalition of dissident unionist politicians, Protestant workers and loyalist paramilitaries, including the Militant Ulster Defence Association, came together, intent on destroying the new power-sharing administration. Their action became known as the Ulster Workers' Council strike. Ian Paisley played a central role. How did you feel, though, about sitting down with Andy Terry, the leader of the Ulster Defence Association, given that his people were on the streets, involved in wholesale intimidation, forcing people to close down their businesses, stopping people from going to work and going about their daily duties as a citizen, as a, as a Democrat, sir? I how was, did you feel? I was sitting at a table uh, not uh, to talk to people like that. Uh, and, and the situation was just simply this. Uh, we had to get this thing finished with. And I certainly believed uh, that there was a merit. There was a merit in, in, in having a, a, a council strike. And did you not feel that this was a violation of democracy, though, from your perspective? If people were taking the law into their own hands, weren't you essentially challenging the very essence no, of rule of law? I, no, I was not. I was not. So are you saying then that the people who were masked on the street, who were blocking roads, who were seizing cars, who were smashing up cars, are you saying that what they were perfectly doing, okay? You're putting out a broad thing and you're saying everybody that took part in this uh, was a lawless person and were prepared to break the law. Uh, that's not so. And they didn't break the law. The country went on. The country went on. Its businesses went on. Its, its democracy went on. But it was not business as usual. 60% of businesses ended up paralysed with the power station workers bringing life close to a standstill. Worse was to follow. Loyalist paramilitaries now switched their focus to the Republic of Ireland, killing 33 people in two attacks. On May 17, 1974, bombs went off in Dublin and in Monaghan during the Ulster workers' uh, strike. Just how much of a shock was that to your system? Well, I was, uh, I was shocked. Uh, 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 very much shocked that there was anyone going to be hurt in that way. But, I mean, uh, who brought that on them? Selves was the people that uh, their own political leaders whom they had endorsed and what they their attitude to Northern Ireland and uh, at that time the attitude of the uh, of the southern government in Northern Ireland was ridiculous was. are you saying in any sense that the bombing of Dublin and Monaghan was justified because of no, the political I'm, action of the Irish government no, supporting a council of I Ireland? don't believe in killing and never have let me ask you though, when those bombings took place mm -hmm. in Dublin, blamed on the Ulster Volunteer Force, mm -hmm. did you consider walking away from the UWC strike at that point in time? I had nothing to do with that. I accept that. that. And not I only had nothing to do with it, but I said I had nothing to do with it and denounced the people who had done it. I accept that. What more could I do? Surely you connected those bombs being exploded in Dublin with what was going on in the streets of Northern Ireland. What I'm asking you is, did you consider walking away from this strike in the interest of maybe uh, stopping other killings? I, uh, I uh, took my stand. I denounced what that was wrong. Uh, but uh, 
I, I could not say to the people, just sit down and let them put a rope around your neck. Eleven days later, the Faulkner-led power-sharing executive collapsed. Ian Paisley and the Ulster Workers' Council had achieved their goal. If you're not prepared to govern Northern Ireland like any other part of the United Kingdom, then let the Ulster people do the job for themselves. The IRA, meanwhile, stepped up its campaign at home and in Britain. With direct rule restored, Northern Ireland lurched from crisis to crisis and from atrocity to atrocity, with the rival paramilitary organisations bombing and shooting. In London, Ian Paisley was increasingly seen as part of the problem. There are those who would have charged that you kept uh, stirring the pot. Jim Callaghan accused you of using the language of war cast in a biblical mould. Edward Heath called you a demagogue and a wrecker, while Roy Mason remembered you as an oafish bully and a poisonous bigot. What do you yes. say to those allies? Oh, just laughed at them, laughed at them. <laughs> they did a lot for Northern Ireland. They did a lot for Northern Ireland. And of course, when I when I read that stuff now, and you read it to me, I really have a chuckle, because I, I certainly didn't think I was doing so well. Ian Paisley led a second strike in 1977, demanding tougher action against the IRA and a return to unionist majority rule at Stormont. You said the great decisions were taken by elected leaders, yes. but yet there were hundreds of UDA men on the street. They weren't elected by anyone. They were affiliated with people who were killing. They were affiliated with people who were lying in jail, convicted of murder. Where did that sit with you as a Democrat? Were you uncomfortable? Did it ever occur to you that you wished you hadn't been affiliated or associated with those people? The people that uh, we were working with, uh, the majority of them were men with clean hands and right spirits. And of course, in any uh, situation like this, you would have a, a, a degree of difficulties. And uh, we had our difficulties, but I think that we come out of them well. But is that acceptable, though? Is that good enough well, just to I've talk about the, difficulties? Well, if, it's, if, it's, if people... it's all right for you to sit there and me to sit here and comfort at this time and say that. Uh, these were serious days. We have uh, the King's Mill massacre. We have all of these things coming in. Surely the time had come when people had to take the risk of their own lives. So uh, all I'm saying, I take my hat off to the people of Northern Ireland who stood and stood well in a, 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 a very difficult time. But this time the strike did not attract widespread support. Despite a pledge to quit public life if it failed, the DUP leader continued his agitation. The arrival of a new Conservative government in May 1979, headed by Margaret Thatcher, encouraged unionists to expect a tougher anti-IRA stance. Where there is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. And where there is despair, may we bring hope. Only two months earlier, her close adviser and hardline Northern Ireland spokesman, Erie Neve, had been murdered by Republicans. Did you believe that she would be a good friend to Northern Ireland? Yes, I, I, I thought she would be a good friend to Northern Ireland, but I was sadly disappointed. On a single day in the first months of Mrs. Thatcher's premiership, the IRA killed the Queen's cousin Earlman Batten and some members of his family at Mullochmore in the Republic and 18 soldiers at Narrow Water near Warren Point, County Down. But this mounting violence failed to cool Anglo-Irish relations. In 1980, the Prime Minister flew into Dublin to be embraced by the controversial Taoiseach Charles J. Hawhey. 
Out of that historic meeting emerged an agreement to conduct joint studies on areas of common interest. This became known as the Totality of Relationships, a development which was anathema to Ian Paisley. How much of a betrayal did you feel uh, that was by Mrs Thatcher when she went to Dublin, embraced Charles J. Hawley and engaged in this arrangement? Well, uh, I think that it, it really uh, stirred people that here we have the Prime Minister going around and, and having this uh, sort of love in uh, with this house. I don't think that uh, uh, she should be negotiating with Dublin at all on the future of this part of the United Kingdom. This hardened the DUP leader's resolve. He embarked on a series of actions in the style of his role model, Edward Carson, the unionist leader who had led the resistance to Irish independence at the start of the 20th century. The first of these was a rally of 500 men, the so-called Paisley's Army, at night on a County Antrim hillside. They didn't carry guns but waved firearm certificates to demonstrate their access to weapons. This is only a small token of many thousands of men who are pledged to me and I am pledged to them to stand together at this time of grave trouble in Northern Ireland. What message were you hoping to send out to the outer world, given the presence of those men brandishing those uh, gun licenses? And that Ulster will fight and Ulster will be right, and there will be no surrender. Who came up with that idea to form Paisley's army on the side of that mountain? Whose idea was that? It was my idea, and it was a warning uh, to Mrs Thatcher, uh, and to the, the, the powers that be in Westminster. And it was a warning also to the nationalist people uh, of Northern Ireland and the whole of Ireland that, uh, that there, there were people who would not uh, be uh, run uh, uh, and bargained over and their future bargained over uh, by Mrs Thatcher or anyone else. Throughout 1981, Northern Ireland woke up to reports of huge Carson Trail rallies and quasi-paramilitary gatherings of the self-styled Third Force. Ian Paisley was mobilising to thwart the IRA. As this was happening, Republicans in the Mays jail embarked on a series of hunger strikes demanding to be treated as political prisoners. The death of Bobby Sands, followed by nine others, led to an upsurge in electoral support for Sinn Féin. If an IRA man comes to a Protestant home and my men are there, they will kill that IRA man. Yes, sir. And what if they found themselves in conflict with the British security forces? Well, if the British security forces are going to join up with the IRA to kill Protestants, then we will be in conflict with them. How dangerous a statement was that coming from well, you as a political leader? It was a statement that needed to be made. We, we don't, I mean, this was a matter of life or death. Despite Ian Paisley's protests, Dublin's growing involvement in the affairs of Northern Ireland continued. It culminated in the then Taoiseach, Dr. Gair Fitzgerald and Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher signing the Anglo-Irish Agreement at Hillsborough Castle in 1985. This gave Dublin a consultative role in political and security matters in Northern Ireland. Did Mrs. Thatcher betray you when she afforded Dublin a foothold in the affairs of Northern Ireland through the Anglo-Irish Agreement signed in November 1985. Do you oh, yes, think she betrayed was, you? I guess so. It was a surrender document. And, uh, and even a very mild unionists would admit that. I mean, it did unite the unionist people. And I mean, for the first time, uh, I could sit in company with... Uh, 
Ulster Unionists uh, who, who saw the same way as I was seeing. In the aftermath of the signing of the Anglo-Irish Agreement, the DUP leader raged against the Thatcher government. The Iron Lady was now public enemy number one. Ian Paisley and a broad section of unionism held a mass rally at Belfast City Hall. Where do the terrorists return to for sanctuary? To the Irish Republic! And yet Mrs. Thatcher tells us that that republic must have some say in our province. We say never, 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 never. Was that a spur of the moment remark, that never, never, never remark you made? Well, it was a spur of the moment because I, in situations like that, I allow my heart to guide me. And uh, the fact that you are bringing this today shows it rung a bell. You further added, this is a war, and that no one mints words about it. People have already been hurt. People will be hurt, and sacrifices will have to be made. We're going to marshal and organize and mobilize the forces of those who are opposed to this anglo irish agreement. The government will have to learn that they cannot force down the throats of the Protestant people this abominable agreement. Wasn't that a challenge to the state? Yes, that was a challenge, and we won. We have won. But wasn't that very incendiary language to no, be used? It needed to be. This was a, this was no joke. This wasn't a, a, a display of men who just wanted to clear their throats. Every man that went out was prepared to give their life. While Ian Paisley was in America in August the following year. He learned that his Democratic Unionist Party deputy, Peter Robinson, was grabbing the headlines. He had marched with several hundred supporters across the border into the village of Clontibret in County Monaghan in the early hours of the morning. Peter Robinson wanted to demonstrate the alleged absence of border security. The episode was to create tensions between the DUP leader and his deputy. I will continue to protest against the lack of security, particularly along the, the border with the Republic of Ireland. The a member of your family said to me that you consider Peter Robson a silly ass for doing what he did. Did you think he was a silly ass to do what he did? Well, I, 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 uh, I don't think that I used that expression, but I, I don't, it should not have been done. There was a feeling within your family, some members of your family, that he might have been making a bid for the leadership at that point in time. Everybody else has that, uh, a right to decide for themselves what their answer to that is. I think he uh, thought there was going to be a tremendous uprising as a result of all that. No, no, that didn't happen. Did you suspect that Peter Robinson might shift or move to the Ulster Unionist Party at that point in time when he stepped down as your deputy leader? No, because the Ulster Unionists didn't like him. So they didn't, they didn't, they didn't like him. Peter Robinson disputes Mr Paisley's account of the origins of the protest, saying it had been a recollection failure and that Ian Paisley himself had agreed to go to Flintibbert. He ended up paying a fine of 17,500 pound. How damaging was that to your party at that point in time, the fact that people in the street in his own community referred to him as Peter the Punt? That's the thing that he has to bear. I mean, uh, it, uh, he did it, and he must uh, take account for it. And uh, it, 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 it's so unimportant, you know, in, in the light of what was happening. It was only like a fella scratching uh, a match, and the match burns out, and that's when he throws it away. Neither the Anglo Irish Agreement nor the Loyalist protest succeeded in curbing IRA violence in Northern Ireland or Britain. The bombing 
of a Remembrance Day service in Enniskillen was the most notorious of many atrocities in this period. Nevertheless, the government was prepared to embark on secret talks with the IRA. But this did not stop the IRA taking its campaign to the heart of government. The cabinet itself had a narrow escape when Downing Street was attacked with mortar bombs. I think it was a crowner for the IRA. They were, they did well out of it, so that, that they could go right in and, and do that. I, 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 th I thought it should have put more of a strength into the muscle of the cabinet to go out and deal with the IRA that should have, the way they should have been dealt with. But the British government steadfastly kept the lines of communication open to the Republican leadership. Eventually, this led to the IRA ceasefire in the summer of 1994. Jim Molyneux, the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party at that point in time, said of the IRA ceasefire, it was the worst thing that ever happened to us. Did you share that view at that time? Yes, yeah, certainly. Why did no unionists see any merit in that IRA ceasefire announcement at that time? Well, I think that the people had, uh, had been so let down uh, that they had no trust in the British government getting us a proper road to getting out of the killings and getting out of the agitations made to try and destroy what our forefathers had fought for and died for. Meanwhile, a roadmap to peace had been identified and Ian Paisley would be asked to swallow even tougher medicine. With the full-blown intervention of London, Dublin and Washington in the affairs of Northern Ireland, protracted talks chaired by US Senator George Mitchell resulted in the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. I'm pleased to announce that the two governments and the political parties of Northern Ireland have reached agreement. Ian Paisley's great political rival, David Trimble, the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, agreed a deal giving Republican seats in government and guaranteeing that all paramilitary prisoners will be set free within two years. As the final touches were being put to the agreement, Ian Paisley and members of his party brought their opposition to the heart of the talks at Stormont. Let me, let me say, let me say to you tonight. Let me say, Ian, where are you taking us? Ian, where are you going to take us? The Grand Old Two New York, Mark One and Mark Two. Not to get in the head. Well, I wish you would walk out. Now, yes, 71.12%. The people of Ireland, North and South, ratified the outcome of the Good Friday Agreement in a referendum just over a month later. Ian Paisley was once more on the outside. At that moment in time, how did you feel as uh, as an outsider? Did you feel no, uh, did you, disturbed? You, no, I isolated, don't. alone? No, because uh, the 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 official unionists uh, uh, were divided on the issue, very much divided. What was wrong with that deal? Why did you not uh, accept such a deal? Because you don't sell, sign a deal that's going to in the end destroy you. Of the Good Friday Agreement, you said it was the greatest betrayal ever feisted by a unionist leader on the unionist people. That's right. Is that how you saw it? That's what it was. It was, it was a, a selling out of all that we stood for and all that our fathers died for. And, uh, and, 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 and the people I was speaking for were the people who gave their lives in two world wars to, to, to keep us in a place of freedom. 
And uh, this thing goes into the very core of the Ulster man and the Ulster unionist. And I don't think it's, it's understood. Uh, Ulster unionists can fight things among themselves and be very cruel in themselves. But there is a place where we all join together and where blood is mixed with blood and bones are mixed with bones. We say, so far, but no farther.